This video gives a brief introduction to single-cell RNA-seq data analysis. We will first look how RNA single-cell RNA-seq works and what can go wrong in the process. What are unique molecular identifiers and why do we use them? What are empties, doublets and dropouts? Why this data is so challenging to analyze? What are the main analysis steps for clustering cells and finding market genes for those clusters? And what is the run? So single-cell RNA-seq is a relatively new technology and the data analysis methods are still being actively developed. New ones are popping up all the time. Gene expression profiling at single-cell level has many applications, so we can detect cell types, also rare ones. We can study cellular differentiation processes. We can investigate tumor heterogeneity and response to drugs, etc. There are many technologies for capturing single-cell transcriptomes, but this course focuses on the 10x chromium data, which is a droplet-based method. The libraries are usually three prime tagged, so we sequence only a short sequence at the three prime end of the mRNA. So let's have a look how this droplet-based method works. This figure is from the Macusco paper. So we have these barcoded beads on which we have PCR handle, cell barcode, UMI, and a stretch of these. The idea is that the cell barcode will help us determine from which cell the read came from, whereas the UMI helps us to detect PCR duplicates. And the stretch of these is there in order to bind to the poly A tail. So we take these beads, mix them with cells, and hope to form droplets where we have one bead and one cell. Sometimes there are droplets with no cells, we call them empties, and sometimes we end up having two or even more cells in a droplet. Anyway, so in ideal case we have one cell, we will lyse the cell, the mRNA will bind to the beads, then we can disrupt the beads, uh, the, we can disrupt the droplets, we perform reverse transcription and amplification in bulk, and then we sequence. We sequence paired end fashion, so read one will cover the cell barcode and the UMI, and the read two will cover the cDNA part. Then we align these sequences to genome and compare those to the known positions for genes. That way we can map these reads to genes, so we put identity on the reads. And on the other hand, we have the we have the cell barcode information, so we can group these pairs uh, per cell. Then next we look at the UMIs. So there are situations like this. So from the same cell, we get two reads for this particular gene. Now when we look at the UMIs, we notice that they are the same. So these two reads come from the actual same mRNA molecule. So we want to count this only once, not twice, and hence we put one in our count table. Then there is another situation. Again, within one cell, we have two reads for this gene, but the UMIs are now different, indicating that they come from different molecules and hence we will put two to our count table. So in this UMI count table, we have cells as columns and genes as rows, and then the UMI counts in the cells uh, as values in this table. So what can go wrong in the process? I already mentioned that sometimes there is no cell in the droplet. These empties we can detect uh, even if they give some uh, counts, they can give counts if there is some RNA floating around, but those uh, reads will match to a very small number of genes, so we can detect this situation. 
Similarly, we can detect tuplets and multiplets uh, based on the larger than average number of genes expressed. It can also happen that the cell in the droplet is not happy. And we can detect these broken or dead cells because typically the reads, uh, the high percentage of the reads match to mitochondrial transcripts. The mitochondria can remain intact even if the, the cell uh, gets broken. With drop seek data, there can also be problems with barcode synthesis. And there are ways to deal with that too. Now, why is this data so challenging to analyze? First of all, there is a high number of dropouts. Dropout is a gene which is expressed, but we fail to detect the expression due to technical reasons. So we end up having a lot of zeros in our UMI count table. The data is also noisy. So there is high level of variation between the cells due to various technical reasons and also biological reasons. So there are differences in the capture efficiency. So the percentage of mRNAs captured varies. There is also differences in reverse transcription efficiency and amplification. So there, is, um, there can be amplification biases. The total number of UMIs can, per cell can vary a lot. So uh, there can be significant differences in sequencing depth. And finally, also the cell size and cell cycle stage can influence the results. So uh, for these reasons, the distribution of expression values can be very complex. We don't get nice normal distributions, but more like these multimodal distributions. And because of this, also the because of these uh, complex distributions, the analysis methods that we have for bulk RNA-seq data uh, won't work for single RNA-seq data. During this course, we cover the analysis steps uh, for clustering cells and finding marker genes for clusters. So first we need to check the quality of the cells. And if we notice that there are empties or or, or duplets or broken cells, we filter those out. We can also filter out genes which are expressed in only a couple of cells out of the thousand cells we have. Then we normalize the expression values in order to cope with the problems that I listed earlier. And then we want to identify highly variable genes. So we want to focus on variable genes because we want to cluster cells based on the expression values. We don't actually do the clustering directly on the expression values, but we first reduce dimensions using principal component analysis and then use those principal components for clustering. And to get the principal components, we use this highly variable genes that we detect here. Prior to principal component analysis, we need to scale the data so that the high expressing genes don't dominate. And at this point, we can also regress out unwanted technical and biological variation. Once we have the principal components, we need to figure out which ones are significant and then use those to cluster the cells with graph-based clustering. We also use those principal components to visualize the clusters with nonlinear dimensional reductions such as UMAP or TISNI. And finally, we can detect market genes for the clusters and visualize them. During this course, we talk a lot about STARA, which is one of the most popular R packages for single cell RNA seq data analysis. It provides tools for all the steps I mentioned in the previous slide and for many other things. For example, for integrative analysis, where we compare uh, gene expression in, say, unstimulated and stimulated samples, which is also something we covered during this course. Now, SARA stores data in an R object, which is uh, called SARA object. And it contains specific slots for different types of data, like the UMI counts, PCA, and clustering results, etc. 
You might be wondering why this art package is called Serra. Well, it refers to the French painter Serra, who developed the pointillism style of painting. And of course, these points look a bit like the cells in our UMAP plots.